Welcome to the talk. Um, this is joint work with Mark, Thomas, and Torsten uh, while I was in Bochum. And it's actually a follow-up paper on my NSS paper from February where I discuss various uh, ways how you can do amplification attacks abusing UDP-based protocols. The main reason to show you this slide is actually not to tell you that I started my research group in Saarbrücken University, but to show you a subtle notice that we are actually hiring PhD students. So if you are interested in research in network security or system security, please come to me and talk to me after the talk. But now gets, let's get uh, content about amplification attacks. Um, probably you've heard of these kind of attacks in the past. So recently in February, you have had the largest DDoS attack ever uh, against a French hosting provider, which um, subsumized 400 gigabits per second attack traffic. And it just happened to leverage the same attack technique that I've presented at NDSS in February. I hope the attackers just didn't copy this technique for their attack. But this was really the most effective um, DDoS attack that we've ever seen so far. And it kind of motivated us to dive into the topic of amplification attacks further and to really answer the questions how we can do some effective countermeasures against these amplification attacks. Just a brief recommendation how um, amplification attacks work. Um, you do have the attacker on the left-hand side and the victim on the right-hand side. And the attacker just primarily tries to exhaust the bandwidth of the victim. He does so by using the so-called amplifiers in the middle, which uh, do reflect the network traffic. And in the simple case, for example, to make a concrete example, you could use open DNS resolvers as amplifiers. So basically, you would send a DNS request to these um, amplifiers, and they would send responses back. So the attacker um, then impersonates uh, the victim. That is, he sets the source IP address of the request to the IP address of the victim so that the responses effectively do not get back to um, the attacker but instead um, go to the victim. So this is the reflective part. Um, the amplification part is that there's many protocols out there which are connectionless, like uh, DNS, for example, in which you have a um, request which is much considerably smaller than the response being sent back to the victim. So this is the amplification uh, part of the attack. In this work, we mainly try to address uh, two, uh, three things. Uh, one is that we uh, would like to see if we can mitigate the existing protocols um, that we see. Um, mainly, we focus on the worst ever protocol they've seen for amplification, namely the NTP protocol. Um, we secondly dive into um, other protocols than UDP that you can abuse for amplification tags. In particular, we look at TCP. And third, we have a method to identify the root cause of such kind of attacks, namely uh, networks that allow IP address spoofing. About the first part, um, to just give you a small feeling of how many amplification servers we actually have out there, uh, we made this small graph, which shows you the number of amplifiers uh, for a number of protocols that we consider are the worst for amplification in millions. So for example, if you look at the uh, most upper line, you see that we have kind of a steady number of 25 million open DNS resolvers out there which can be abused for amplification attacks. And this is for DNS. We also have SNMP, NTP, SSTB, NetVirus, and a couple of other protocols. And what you can see is that the number of servers is kind of static for most of all these protocols. And we try to now understand really the characteristics of these servers. So what are these systems anyway that um, can be exploited for amplification attacks? We did some various fingerprinting on these amplifiers that we can find, and the, the, the short answer is it's really a diverse set of servers that we found. To give you uh, a, a small hint, for example, uh, look at the SSTP fingerprint result that we see. Uh, typically, these are consumer routers, um, like really typical network devices which run Linux or some other um, variant of uh, Linux. Then again, if you have a net buyers, this is typically just some Windows systems um, which are on the network without a NAT, without a firewall. So it's really diverse set. And lastly, um, for NTP, we have seen that there's lots of networking hardware, especially from Cisco, um, that is vulnerable to amplification attacks. So if you would like to cover all these different protocols, you really need to tackle many different kinds of systems. That's the, the long answer in this. We want to look at NTP a bit closer, because NTP is, um, from my perspective, the worst ever amplification protocol that we've seen so far. It allows you to amplify the traffic by a um, factor of 1,000, approximately, which means by one byte that the attacker can send, the attacker and the victim would receive 1,000 bytes. So this is the factor of 1,000. Um, the whole rationale behind this is that there is this optional monolith feature. 
Um, monitors is de definitely like just an optional debugging feature in many NTP daemon implementations. And it just sends you up on a very tiny request of only eight bytes, sends you up to 45, uh, 44 kilobytes of data back. So this right, gives you the whole amplification factor in there. And when we measured um, the, the first time in December um, 2013, we found uh, 1.6 million of NTP amplifiers that have this particular amplification vulnerability. Um, back then, we thought about a bit, okay, what, what could we do to mitigate this situation? And already when we were um, submitting the paper to NDSS, um, we then notified um, MITRE to reserve a CVE so that we can have some public document on, on the particular vulnerability. And also, we notified the mostly effective vendors, which is uh, Network Time Foundation with the NTP daemon implementation, and also Cisco, with, uh, which basically copied the NTP daemon implementation to their products. Um, in January 2014, we then uh, released the CVE and we started a huge notification routine among uh, different certs and ISPs just to get the people to know that they run such systems that can be abused for amplification tags. And our hope was that such a no notification routine would have a large impact on, on the situation. And we also shared the data with um, kind of data, data on clearing houses, like for example, Shadow Server or Trusted End User, which again have connections to end users to distribute the a list of infected or vulnerable hosts to their end consumers. In February 2014 um, was the presentation at NDSS about this particular vulnerability, and latest then the attack was known. And the next slide will show you a small graph on a time-wise manner, which shows you how many amplification servers we observe for NTP. It starts in November last year, and it has small notes on the events that happened during, during the last month. So in um, December last year, there was the first um, public notification of NTP um, abuse for denial of service attacks by Symantec, but really nothing happened in terms of um, really the number of amplifiers. So back then it didn't re decrease really. But when we started to announce our uh, CVE to release it to make it public and also to share the IP address uh, list with the providers, you can see a sudden decrease of the number of amplifiers out there which eventually after eight weeks of notification, we uh, could reduce the number of amplification servers by 92%, uh, which is really kind of a success. Uh, the main question is if it's not still enough to run attacks, but I think the, the main part of the story is, is clear. If you really have some nice notification procedure um, and you get the contact to the end consumers, um, there is a possibility to actually decrease the number of amplification servers for particular protocols. Then we fixed this one, right? We fixed NTP, and there's 13 other protocols for UDP that could be fixed in principle. And um, we were wondering, hey, let's assume we fix all these 14 UDP-based protocols. What other protocols are there that can be abused for amplification attacks? And then we turned, in particular, um, to analyzing uh, TCP, because we've seen that the TCP handshake also allows you for uh, running amplification attacks. In principle, the TCP handshake does not allow to amplify traffic. So you have a SYN packet to um, the server, and even if the SYN packet is being spoofed, the uh, SYNAC packet coming back from the server, there is only one, so you have some reflection, yes, but you do not really amplify the traffic because the SYNAC packet is the same size as the SYN packet, so you have a one-to-one -one situation. So that's not really a gain in terms of amplification. However, what we found out is that there's many systems, actually it's the default, for example, in Linux, that uh, have packet retransmissions also during the handshake. So for example, you can see that uh, Linux per default sends you soon, uh, six SUNAC packets back. So there in Linux you have a default uh, amplification of uh, factor six. And we found many other systems, um, millions of systems actually, that even have higher amplification factors of 20 or more. We analyzed this in depth for a wood paper that I presented yesterday, and we found out two other attack categories for TCP that you can abuse. For example, uh, we also found that there is many what we call pushy hosts that send back data before the handshake actually completed. So for example, if you send a SYN packet to a tenant server, the tenant server would immediately start sending data to you with the banner information of the server, which is bad implementation, and it's really against any standard, but that's what is happening in practice. And the third category is um, that we found reset storms, that is that you send a SYN packet, and um, if the port is closed, the server will send a single reset normally, but we found many systems that actually send like 10 or even 50,000 resets packet back. So long story short, um, we can also abuse TCP for um, amplification attacks, unfortunately, because there are some devices that really uh, have bad TCP stack implementations, or also because of um, simple packet retransmissions. 
So in essence, that means that we have many different protocols that can be abused for amplification attacks. And the real question is, can we now identify um, the networks that can that cause actually the root the root cause of the problem, mainly um, networks that allow for IP address spoofing. If we hadn't had any network that allows IP address spoofing, we wouldn't have to deal with the problem at all. So um, shutting down IP spoofing altogether would really get rid of the whole problem of amplification attacks. So we were looking for a method that can identify um, networks that allow for IP address spoofing. So far, there's only one project that does this that we are aware of, which asks you to uh, actually download a particular software on your PC to run it in your PC, and locally it can test if your current network really is supporting IP address spoofing or not. This is already a good start, um, but the problem with that is that you don't have really a large coverage. Um, so basically, it requires users to run the software on the local PCs, and if you want to do large-scale tests, you really have to rely on many users running the software on, on many different networks. And that's unfortunately not really happening in practice. So what you really want to have is a method that can identify remote, uh, that can identify IP spoofing networks from remote. And we luckily came up with, with an idea that was originally presented by uh, Jared Mauck in some old mailing uh, post, but then was really lost. Um, so we, we recapped this idea. And it's based on, on DNS. And um, the basic idea is that there is many open um, DNS resolvers which act as proxies, and they have a really awkward artifact and forwarding requests to public resolvers. So here's the trick. Um, we have a scanner on the left-hand side from our university, and we simple scan for open resolvers. And for every um, scan that we uh, basically send just a DNS request. And for every DNS request, we embed uh, the IP address of the open resolver that we send the request to. So for example, if we send the request to the open resolver 1234, we embed the IP address 1234 in the fully qualified domain name of the DNS request that we send out. This allows us um, later on to identify, to really link the request that we send out to the system that sent us the response back. What now is the really artifact of these open proxies is that they forward the request and they have some really weird network address translation going on there. So what basically happens there is that they forward the request and they do not modify the source IP address of our request. Which is for us very cool because this means that these systems are actually spoofing the IP address of our resolver. So this actually is a kind of proof that these systems are in the network that allow for IP address spoofing. It's an awesome artifact that we can uh, use because we again see um, the, the answers coming back. And in this case, the uh, systems would send the, um, would forward the request to some public resolvers, for example, OpenDNS, Google DNS, and then the responses from these public resolvers would be sent back to our university scanner. And what we can see then is essentially that the IP address of, um, of the um, responding party, meaning um, Google DNS or OpenDNS, is not the same IP address um, than the one that we encoded in the request. So for example, in this case, we see that we um, issued a request for 1234, but instead Google DNS with 8888 answered, so there's really a mismatch in the IP addresses. This all is really only based on this one artifact of open DNS practice that we found out, but it's uh, really, really cool for us because it allows you to uh, identify networks from remote that don't uh, allow IP address spoofing. To show you some uh, statistics on this, um, basically we have three different conservative measures how to um, like um, give you numbers on the number of amplification, uh, number of IP spoofing networks. And if you only focus on the replies that we got from the um, top four resolvers, which are two from Google DNS and two from OpenDNS, you can see that there is at least uh, 300 different autonomous systems that allow for IP address spoofing. If you focus on the top 10 resolvers, that is, you also have some AOL um, resolvers in, in the data set, you already find 350 um, autonomous systems that support um, IP address spoofing. And if you, in the least, in the most aggressive setting, you would only check if the IP address of the responding party is in a different autonomous system than the IP address that you sent the request to. And if you do this, you um, already find more than 2,500 networks that allow for IP address spoofing which is um, a bit depressing because it uh, allows many attackers to run amplification attacks. And we are currently in the process of notifying these networks to, um, to get like a feedback why these um, networks allow a address spoofing and if this cannot be changed in the future. 
So the three takeaway messages I want to give you from this talk is that I think um, the NTP amplification landscape has really dramatically changed since we started the notification routine. And um, I think the problem of NTP amplification will hopefully be, be gone in a couple of months because the number is just too small. Um, but we also saw that there is many different ways of uh, running amplification tags, for example, uh, TCP. And I, I guess there it's a bit harder to mitigate the attack because we have seen many hardwares actually running on consumer hardware, which is not that well maintained as hardware running in, in well-equipped networks. And also, with the remote test that we propose, we can find at least 300 autonomous systems out there that um, allow for IP address spoofing, which also uh, well, is, is some kind of a bad message, but something we can work on in the future to reduce the number of implication attacks. I thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions. You seem thirsty. What? You seem thirsty, you guys. <laughs> so, um, what is your future interest in? So the question is, what what the future is? Um, so there, there is a future, and it's, it's going into um, actually identifying the sources of the amplification traffic, which hasn't been done yet. And we're currently working on this to kind of pinpoint where the attack traffic comes from, even though it's spoofed. So that will be the next step. Uh, okay, Aurélien Francillon from Oricom. Um, how much do you think you are responsible for the, um, the figure we saw in the first talk for the scanning? Because I guess you scan many networks. Did you use that map? For that, did you? I mean, did you appear in the scanners in the first talk? So there's not many questions. Uh, um, um, uh, do you think there are many people scanning for finding places where to do mm -hmm. a DOS? So I, I know that we were kind of the first that started the scans, but um, there is now, for example, also the Open NTP project that um, performs scans for NTP, for example. Um, we we do not use ZMap. We have some a custom built scanner which operates in a similar way, I think, than than ZMap. Um, the bad thing is about the graph, we cannot really show causality between our like notification routine and um, the decrease in the number of amplifiers. But I really try to um, add any node to the graph which I think is relevant to this. And I think that the not notification routine that we have and that the Open NTP project has really has the largest effect on the number of, um, on the number of amplification sources out there. Uh, you mentioned that there were TCP protocols that um send data after you send a SIM. Can you repeat which, which protocols, what services do that? Uh, so the worst ones, if I remember well, is um, HTTP and Telnet and FTP. Uh, Telnet and FTP especially because they often send banner information. Um, it often depends also what party sends data first, right? So in HTTP, you would first send the request from the client, so the server doesn't know yet what to respond. But for Telnet and um, FTP, you often have some information that the server wants to send back immediately. So the rationale is probably that there is um, one safe often round trip time because you do not really need to complete the handshake, but you can send data immediately. That's probably the rationale behind this. Do, do you have the IP addresses of the servers that do this? That's, it doesn't seem like normal behavior. It is normal behavior, and it's also reproducible. So you can send multiple SIM packets, and you get like multiple push data back. Um, it's probably for, their, for them it's normal behavior, but I wouldn't call it normal anyway because it's against the standard.